My message today is uh, taken from the words of Moses, Numbering Our Days. Simple little title. Some of you might understand the verse of scripture that it comes from in Psalm 90. But the overarching theme for this month, as I feel God has put it on my heart, is that we want to make our lives count for eternity. God wants us to make our lives count. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at what the Bible says are the three major enemies that we have to deal with in this Christian life. The world, the flesh, and the devil. When we consider the world, we're going to look at an unknown character called Demas and learn lessons from his life that we might understand how we can win this battle with the world. And then Amalek for the flesh. Amalek is a picture of the flesh. It's also a person. It became a tribe, the Amalekites, battle with the flesh. And battle with the devil, we'll look at Job and we'll understand from the book of Job how we can not be full of fear, but we can be full of faith and trust in God. So the world, the flesh, and the devil, and I believe that God wants us to be prepared in all battle fronts so that we can make every day count, every day count for God. I think that would please the Lord. We must all stand before the judgment seat of God as Christians someday, and uh, when we stand, we will give an answer for what we have done. So 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 on the, on the screen, John is writing to the church in his first epistle, and he says, And now, little children, abide in him, that is Christ, so that when Christ appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Jesus is coming soon. I think if anything helped us realize how easily it would be for our world to fall under a one world rulership, it would be through this pandemic as we see behind the scenes, unconsciously to most of our leaders, if not all of them, the plan of Satan as he prepares the world for that dictator that will come. But Jesus is coming. And uh, we don't know how soon. It may not be for a while. <laughs> but we know that he is coming soon. And he says, when I come, it'll be quickly. I don't want to be ashamed when I stand before the Lord on the judgment seat of Christ. I'm not worried about whether I'm going to get to heaven, but I am concerned about what I'm going to do when the rewards are given out. Have I been faithful? Have I made every day count? As it says in the scripture. One of the superb actors of these days was heard a few uh, months ago quoting someone, and I didn't get the original quote, but Leonardo DiCaprio said, at this one time when he was getting in some kind of an award, he said, I figure life's a gift, and I don't intend on wasting it. You don't know what hand you're going to get dealt next. You learn to take life as it comes to you to make each day count. He read that somewhere, heard someone say that, and it made sense to him, and he's making every day count. Long before him, there were a lot of people, Samuel Johnson, a devoted Anglican, a playwright, a poet, an essayist, a moralist, a biographer, editor, great man of God, said, we must learn how, to, we must learn to know the present value of single minutes and endeavor to let no particle of time fall useless to the ground. A great example of someone who makes their life count for the Americans is the former president, Jimmy Carter, I believe he's still living at 97. Amazing man. This is what he said once. And he's a believer. I have one life and one chance to make it count for something. My faith demands that I do whatever I can. Wherever I am, whenever I can. For as long as I can with whatever I have to try to make a difference. And he certainly did make a difference. He became a president of the United States of America. So one day our life is going to flash before our eyes. Let's make sure it's worth watching. <laughs> right. Psalm 90 is the 
psalm we're going to look at this morning. The author of Psalm 90 is Moses. Now we have to understand something about the book of Psalms. There's 150 chapters there, isn't there? And it's a book. We call it the book of Psalms, but it's actually made up of other books. And so there are different books. Chapter 90 is the beginning of the fourth book. The third book, and this was put together by the godly people in the Jewish history, put together to help them through difficult times. So when you come to the uh, third book, that is Psalm 73 to Psalm 79, or 89, pardon me, 73 to 89, it starts off with Asaph, not David. Asaph says, um, Surely God is good to Israel, to all those who are pure in heart. But I almost slipped when I envied the prosperity of the wicked. So Asaph says, I'm, I walked with God. He was known as a prophet. And Asaph said, I saw what was going on. The wicked were winning. And he said, I wonder, what, is it worth serving God? And so the rest of the psalm says, it is worth it, but it happens if we're not careful. And that's how the, the, the third book begins with that kind of a statement. You come to the last chapter, 89, and the author of uh, chapter 89, and you don't dare try to read this, I just wanted to make a point. From verse 38 to 51, listen to the psalmist as they, this, so these psalms were put together for people that were in captivity in Babylon. They said, here's the book of psalms, and they arranged them, not historically or chronologically, they just arranged them with an intention that they would read the, fourth, the third book, and they would say, yes, I feel this is a terrible place to be in. And it says words like this, starting at verse 8. I just took the first phrase. But you have rejected us. This is the psalmist talking to God. You have renounced your covenant with us. You have broken down Israel's wall and reduced our strongholds. You have made us a laughing stock. You have exalted the hand of our enemies. You have not supported us in battle. You have put an end to Israel's splendor. You have cut short the days of your youth. How long will you hide yourself forever? How fleeting is our lives. We cannot be saved from death. Where is your former love? We bear in our hearts the taunts of the nation. nations. They have mocked us every step we take. Those are the concluding verses. Pretty dark time, pretty discouraging time for the people in Israel. Now they're in Babylon and it's somewhere in that 70 year period where the Babylonians and the Persians have them and they are in captivity. And this is how they're feeling. Where, oh God, are those glory days, right? And so strategically, they take this oldest psalm in the whole book, the only one written by Moses, and they put it as number 90, the beginning of the fourth book of the book of books, Psalms. And so that I try to help you understand. So the purpose of chapter 89 and the ones just before that was to get Israel to look back before they had a human king, when God was their king. To look back to a time when Moses was their leader and God was their king and they had no human king. Look back to a time when they became a nation before David was even thought about. Those were the good old days. Before they said, we want to be like the rest of the nations and have our own king. And God said, you can have one. And there'll be some pretty good ones, but there'll be some pretty bad ones. And you will pay for having a king. Don't try to be like the other nations, but they did. And God let them. Look back to a time when Moses led you as a people. They had no human king, but Yahweh, God Almighty, Jehovah was their king. And then he's basically saying, Yahweh is still your true king, folks. <laughs> and then it begins in Psalm chapter 90, the fourth book, the first one. The first song taken and draw, uh, draws the readers away from the current state of affairs. And this exile that they've been in for a long time. Even before they came into Canaan, takes them back. So this oldest psalm in the collection, Moses writes, and I want to take a few verses from it as you can read them with me. Starting at verse 9 of Psalm 90, David, or Moses says, 
For all our days pass under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, and even by reason of strength, maybe 80. <laughs> Yet their span is toil and trouble. They're soon gone and they fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the, to the fear of you? And then he comes to a prayer. So God, because of this, teach us to number our days that we might get a heart of wisdom. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for a sense of your presence. We exalt in our hearts the wonderful person, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Prince of Peace, the one we love, the one we adore, the one who saved us, who ransomed us. We thank you for Jesus. And now, Lord, we look into your word. We ask that the Holy Spirit will take the word of God and apply it to our hearts today, whatever our address is, whatever our situation is, whoever we are. And help us, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we start at verse 12. And if you go to the end of the chapter, it becomes a prayer to God after he's made these statements about, wow, life is tough. 70, maybe 80, but boy, those are tough 80 years. I know, that kind of stuff. And then he says, so Lord, teach us to number our days. And then he goes on in other verses and he says, oh Lord, relent of this these enemies that are attacking us. Have compassion on us. Please satisfy us. All those kind of things. It becomes a prayer. But I want to take this first verse, this first plea, and just focus on it this morning as we begin this uh, next little while. We will focus this morning on this prayer. Basically, because life is so short, Lord, please teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Well, this past week, I discovered that my nine-year-old little car just died. <laughs> well, it happens when you get uh, a problem with the motor of it. And uh, so I realized I had to go to the junk pile. So I thought I would take a picture of it with Kathy because that's we got it for her when she had to drive to Peterborough nine, ten years ago. Anyway, sent it to my boys. And uh, I said, we had nine years, and a couple of them said, nine already? Wow. And uh, in the same text, I said, I just started thinking about it, nine years. That's like one for every seven years, every seven, one day out of every seven, I've owned that little car. But I just bought it yesterday. Is my life that short? Has it gone that? And I just started thinking about it. So I said to my boys, and I felt the Holy Spirit do this. I have four boys. I said, well, Nathan turned 30 this January, halfway to 60. Josh is 39, he's in his 40th year, he's halfway to 80. Joel's 30, 37, <laughs> I have to think for a second. He's 37, he's halfway to, he's lived halfway to 75. And Ben's 35, he's going to be 70 in, double, you know, double it up. And I really believe that God wanted me to help my boys because they're so young. <laughs> and they think that 70 or 80 years is so long. And, they, and you know what? I got from the re, their response that it was really the Holy Spirit that inspired me for them to just say, whoa, I'm halfway there almost, you know. And it didn't seem that long ago that I, I don't remember starting in all that stuff. Anyway. When we're young, we think those 70 or 80 years seem like an eternity. <laughs> but time passes, and soon we realize that actually pretty short. Once we get into the mid-40s or so, we become deeply aware that uh, we have not yet done in our lifetime the things that we thought we wanted to do. And there's this sense of pressing urgency that happens somewhere in the 40s, for some in the 50s maybe, and we, as it begins to settle in this reality. And so hence, the bucket list, right? <laughs> Somebody said, I've got to do this before I retire. I've got to do this when I retire. And the bucket list starts. <laughs> when I was an RD in Toronto, really, uh, regional director, um, overseeing the churches in Toronto, because of the fact that there were so many churches from different countries, uh, they were always wanting me to go with them back to their country, maybe speak at a conference, 
I would meet their superintendents once in a while. So I just held off. I, I didn't want to seem to take advantage of this opportunity. The other regional directors didn't have this, but I eventually caved in gladly. <laughs> And I went to some of those countries, but there was one place that I kept putting off, and that was Taiwan. We had a Chinese church, and, and Pastor James Ko wanted me to go and speak to his Bible college, and, and I kept saying, okay, well, next year. Okay, well, next year. Well, I'm not the regional director anymore. I'm not likely going to go to Taiwan by myself. And so I missed that opportunity. Time goes fast, doesn't it? There's some things that you just regret putting off. And that was one of them. When I was starting uh, at a new church at age 32, I became the assistant pastor after being the senior pastor for seven years and assisted Gerald Stevenson. On our first or second day, we're driving around together in Burlington and, and Gerald says, you know, Tom, they, you know, there comes a time in your life in ministry when you don't look at how many years you've been in ministry you start looking at how many years you have left. <laughs> and he was right, I was 32 then. And somewhere in the 40s, I started to think, oh, I'm gonna be 65 in. <laughs> That's the way life is, isn't it? Well, I crossed that threshold a long time ago, by the way, <laughs> I guess you know that. <laughs> and so are some of you here. <laughs> and, uh, and that's this place where some people have a midlife crisis, I suppose. Well, there's a, quite a complaint in these verses just prior to the text, in verses 9 to 11. It says, it's a lament. And Moses is saying, we bring our years to an end like a sigh. If by reason of strength, there's there are 80, basically there's about 70 of those years in those days before all of our health uh, helps these days. Yet their span is trouble. Soon they're gone and they fly away. It's kind of a lament and he sets us up for this prayer that he tells us to, to make in the next chapter. Basically, Moses is asking God to give the people an awareness of their limits because only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. We'll reap, uh, I was reading to study this and I came across a couple of good things that were said in the, uh, what's it called, the application commentary, great commentary. It's, uh, Dennis Tucker said, we will reap a heart of wisdom if we approach life with a prayerful awareness of our weakness and complete dependence on him. I thought that was good. James Grant in the same commentary said, we can pray Moses' prayer boldly because we pray to a God and he is full of mercy and grace and he can change our experience. Isn't that great? Hallelujah. Psalm 90 gives us guidance this morning as we are confronted by the brevity of our lives here on earth. These verses not only speak of the brevity of our lives, but they speak of the frailty of our lives, don't they? Once we realize the frailty and the brevity of our lives, we have to adopt a frame of mind that Moses is telling us about. That right attitude of dependence on God, and this attitude should characterize every day, apparently. He said, number your days. So today, at the beginning of another year, almost pretty well, we need to make it our prayer and our theme is specifically for this month of February. So the next three Sundays, we will consider the theme of facing our enemies and we'll look at those three enemies one by one because we want to live a life that's pleasing to God we want to be victorious amen don't want to just scrape through and make it we want to be victorious so we're going to look at these three big enemies the world the flesh and the devil starting next week with the word so Psalm 90 gives us some good sound advice and how we can leave live these brief lives that God has blessed us and given us given to us as I said in those three verses before verse 12, basically you can summarize it by saying, time flies, life is uncertain, and God judges sin, in verse 11. So he's saying, because of those things, Lord, teach me to number my days, that I might have a heart of wisdom. Teach us. God alone is the one who can teach us what we need to be taught. There are not many of these days, uh, pardon me, should 
get away from my notes here, but I have to make sure I don't miss anything. We need to have a right perspective on living. When I was in Burlington, as I mentioned a little while ago with Gerald Stevenson, there was a retired pastor there and his name was Doug Rudd. I had seen him at conferences, I knew about him when he wasn't retired. Well, he was sort of out of retirement and he was the pastor of the seniors in Burlington where he lived. But he also helped the district doing what I'm doing today. So Doug Red is with us. He's in his late 60s, early night, uh, late early night, a sorry, late 60s, early 70s. So I would go to see him whenever he was in the office, which was quite often two or three times a week. And every time I went in, whether it was nine o'clock or eleven o'clock, he would have his Bible open and he would be going like this, reading his Bible. What a tremendous example. Here's a guy who's done it all, been a successful pastor, and all he wants to do is read God's word. Well, Pastor Doug left there, became a transition pastor in Toronto for a few months, and then, guess what he did? He decided to plant a church in his 70s. So he started a church down in Eglinton, St. Clair, a church called Good News. He started that church, and he grew it to a certain size, and he handed it over to a pastor after two or three or four years. I can't remember now. And then after that, what did he do when he was in his late 80s and 90s? He had church online. And every day he went online and he preached the gospel. And he answered questions to people. He just kept going. What a great example to me. His granddaughter's married to my cousin. And so I got to know her uh, through him. And uh, what a great example she had of a grandfather who loves the Lord. When Moses said number... It meant to weigh out, weigh them out or enumerate them. So it's a bit of calculating that he's talking about. Enumerates an interesting translation. I'm talking about the dictionary definition of this, of what meant, is meant in the Greek. It means to plan ahead in your mind, budget your time and your days. So we're inviting God to help us consider both the shortness and the miseries of this life and the certainties and nearness of death and the causes and consequences of these facts so that we might have a heart of wisdom. Gain a heart of wisdom. What is a heart of wisdom anyway? It's a heart that's attuned to God. It's a heart that's in sync with God and to God's purposes. A person with a heart of wisdom understands how to navigate life successfully in God's good but yet fallen world that we live in. There's an old poem that I've read a number of times at funerals, The Clock of Life. The clock of life is wound but once, and no man has the power to tell just when the hands will stop at late or early hour. To lose one's wealth is sad indeed. To lose one's health is more. To lose one's soul is such a loss that no man can restore. The present only is our own. So live, love, toil with a will. Place no faith in tomorrow, for the clock may then be still. Something, eh? Robert H. Smith, an eh? American Lutheran theologian, wrote that. Life begins at Calvary. For me, it did at age 18. That's when I truly began to live. I gave my heart to Christ and I was born again. Oh, when I look back in those first 18 years, I think I did some somewhat significant things. You know, I set a few records at high school, wasn't a few, a uh, couple of all, all Ontario teams and all of that, you know, significant things. I worked at this job and that job. And so I thought it was kind of significant, the things that I did before I came to Christ. And I guess I was making my presence known and some kind of worth in the world. But I discovered something when I started to read the Bible that my life before I came to Christ were kind of like lost years. Let me explain. Jesus told a parable in Matthew 20, a parable of laborers. So let's look at the words starting at verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius. That's about a day's pay for, for the day. And he sent them into his vineyard. It's a 12-hour day for the Jews, 6 to 6. 
They work harder than us, apparently. However, they do have a good long break at high noon. About nine in the morning, third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went. A few years ago when I was in Israel, uh, it was early morning Jerusalem, and I got there and uh, we went, I think it was the garden tomb we were going to, and all around us were these diesel trucks and they're running, mostly Arabs, and they were just waiting for someone to come along and hire them. They were just, they were just idling in their trucks, they were just waiting. And some got hired early and some got hired later. Interesting, they keep that same kind of culture going. It says here, he went out again about noon, and about three in the afternoon, and he did the same thing. Then it's five o'clock in the afternoon, and only an hour left. And he went out and found others still standing around. And listen to Jesus' words. Why are you standing around all day doing nothing? Wow, nothing. Because no one has hired us. Nobody told me. It's a sad thing, isn't it? When you talk to somebody in their 60s, 70s, or 80s, and you share the good news of Jesus, and they say, I never heard that before. It's so sad, isn't it? Jesus taught that what a person does amounts to nothing until they begin working in his vineyard. Quite a thought, isn't it? I know people don't like to hear that, but anyway. And they all got the same pay. They all got eternal life. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Not their fault they didn't get hired. <laughs> right. Yes. When they found out that there was an opportunity, they took advantage and they were saved. And they're going to be in heaven and get eternal life just like me. I know there's more to this, but, but that's the message of this particular parable. It also is the message when God calls Israel out of Egypt. It says in Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. So what had happened? What, what's the background here? The people of God were in Egypt and Pharaoh who represents Satan, had, was their taskmaster, and he kept giving them more work. He didn't want them to leave Egypt, that place of bondage. It's all figurative language. And so the only solution was that there would had to be a Passover lamb that was slain in each household, and the blood from the lamb was put on the doorposts of their homes in Egypt. And the death angel came over Egypt, and if you had the blood over your doorposts, the death angel passed over your home, and the home where there was a firstborn but no blood, the firstborn died all over Egypt. It was a terrible, terrible thing that happened. They leave Egypt, and now they're on their way to the promised land, and God says, Moses, this is the beginning. This is the first day. This is the first month of the time when they consider the people of Israel, the people of Israel. Interesting. Bottom line. It was a new beginning for the children of Israel once the blood of the Passover lamb, Jesus, was applied to the doorposts of their homes or their hearts. And they came out of Egypt, that place of bondage, being delivered out of the hand of evil Pharaoh, Satan. And it was a brand new beginning. Hallelujah. I thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Amen. Well, that's before I got saved. What about after I get saved? Moses said to the people of God, teach me to number my days. Well, Abraham, what do you think? Abraham was just like this perfect example, and in so many ways he was. However, there were a few lost years. Abraham, in... in, in in Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7, you'll see the different uh, verses there. It might be hard to read, but Stephen tells us in his sermon that God calls Abraham from Ur of the Chaldeans. That's Mesopotamia. He says, call him. Now what we don't get when we read Genesis is that he only made it part way. He stopped at Haran. 
and so he's still in Turkey somewhere. And he stops there, and a little bit later, God comes to him, Genesis chapter 11, because he half obeyed. I don't know how many years there were between the time he was told to leave his father's house to the time he got to Haran. I don't know how many years it was. It's not recorded, it's lost. Nobody knows. But anyway, at 75 years of age, he says, now, make your way to Canaan, the promised land. So Abraham makes his way on. In chapter 12, at age 75, and uh, for the next few years, 11 years, that's all, there are over 100 verses describing what happened in those 11 years. Details of the things that did down to Egypt, the issues, this and that, Lot and his problems and Sodom and Gomorrah, all of that, so much detail is given to those 11 years. There's over 100 verses, nine verses for every year. And then we come to the end of chapter 16, near the 98th verse. And it says there that uh, Abraham and Sarah put a plan together. Let's help God, you know, with this problem. I can't become pregnant, so take my slave girl, Hagar, and have children with her. Seemed like a good plan. And he was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. That's the end, the last verse in chapter in Genesis 16. The first verse of chapter 17 says, When Abraham was 99. 13 years. Well, are those 13 years not what I'm telling us about? Well, there's nothing in the scripture. As long as he was obeying and leaving Haran at 75, there was a full history of those 11 years. 100, almost 100 verses. And now there's 13 years and there's no verse at all to tell us what happened during those 13 years. I think there's a lesson in here for us to what I'm saying. At age 99, he decided, okay, God, promised him again. He became circumcised. That's introduced to the people of Israel, which literally means cut off the flesh. Abraham, it's time to cut the flesh off, to deal with the flesh. And so, spiritually, he stopped living in the flesh and began living in the spirit. And we know the rest is history. Bottom line is, is this God's way? It's just a question. It's just God's way of telling us that those years following Jesus, if the flesh dominates, maybe they don't count or they're not worth recounting. Well, let's go along with an idea that comes from Paul's sermon in Antioch in Acts chapter 13. Now, I'm going to read it, and my wife is going to throw up some things. So just listen carefully. This is Peter, and he's rehearsing the history of the people of Israel. It says, standing up, I said Peter, Paul. Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites, you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The people of God... And the God of the people of Israel, I should say, chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. And with a mighty hand, he led them out of that country. And now life begins, right? They left Egypt. For about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness. 40. He overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. And all this took 450 years. 40 years in the wilderness, 450 years in Canaan. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel. Then the people asked for a king. And he gave them Saul, son of Kish, from the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled over them 40 years. And after removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, a son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, he'll do everything I want him to, and in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, it says, David, as he comes to the end of his days, rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. He had reigned 40 years in Israel, 7 in Hebron, and 33 in Jerusalem. So, if you look at all of those years, they add up to 573 years. So, in 1 Kings chapter 6, we have... A mathematical issue, a contradiction or something. 
It says in the 480th, well, actually back there, I forgot to tell you, let's just add three years of Solomon's reign for good measure. Uh, now you'll understand. First Kings chapter six, in the 480th year, after the Israelites had come out of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel. So it's the 480th year, it's the third year, it's after, it's in the fourth year, so three years of Solomon, that's where I get my three years of Solomon. So if you take the 480, subtract it from the 573, hmm, there's a 93 year problem we got here, right? All you mathematicians are saying, hurry up, we got it. <laughs> Israel is a nation. Watchman Nee explains what happens here. So the people in Israel are in the time of Judges. Are we following along there, Kathy? Good. The animation's not working, so... It's oh, how nice. Yeah. Just lovely. What's the point? I don't know. So that was all planned. We even rehearsed how this was going to come in one at a time. Yeah. All right. It was going to be dramatic, but it's not now. <laughs> Judges chapter 3. So just listen as I put you to sleep here for a few verses. The people of Israel did what was right in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served other Baals, or Baal and Asherah, uh, other gods. Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he sold them, sold them into the hands of the king of Mesopotamia, and the people served the king of Mesopotamia for eight years. So the Israelites... We're under the bondage, the stranglehold of the king of Mes uh, Mesopotamia. And I'll just have to now go quickly, right? They're not coming in, Kathy? No, okay. So if you go to the next 14th verse of that chapter, you will see that the Israelites turned away from God and God sent Moab. And Moab, to that nation, they were enslaved for 18 years. You come to the story that we read last week about Deborah, and it says there that the Canaanites ruled over them for 20 years, oppressed them. You come to the book of Judges, uh, chapter 7, verse 6, chapter 6, for, in Gideon, the Midianites, seven years. And then you come to Samson, and it says the Philistines, they oppressed them and ruled over them for 40 years. So Watchman Nee added all of those up, and guess what he found? Wow, incredible, isn't it? Maybe... What's happening in Acts? Paul is narrating the whole history of Israel. He came up with 573. And the person who wrote the book of Kings may be emphasizing the spiritual history. The time when they were not oppressed and they were not run down and beaten down by the enemy. And so he excluded those 93 years, the last years. So perhaps the bottom line is not every day counts. <laughs> In God's books. And the reason is because there's the world, the flesh, and the devil. And I believe God wants us to be aware of that so that we can number our days. And over the next three Sundays, we're going to have a frontal attack and ideas of how to attack that love for the world that can creep into our hearts, that battle with the flesh, and also that battle with the unseen enemy, the devil. And God will equip us so that we can make our lives count. For good for the kingdom of God. Abraham Lincoln said, in the end, it's not the years in your life that count, it's the life in your years. Hallelujah. Let's get life into our years. <laughs> Would you just close your eyes with me and it's just so you can listen to the words of this poem that was written by missionary C.T. Studd a few years ago. <clears throat> Two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart, and from my mind would not depart. Only one life twill soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet, and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life twill soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice, 
gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears, each with its clays I must fulfill, living for self or in his will. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep. In joy or sorrow, thy word to keep. Faithful and true, whate'er the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn. And from the world, now let me turn. Living for thee and thee alone, bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Let me say thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say twas worth it all. Only one life which will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. The last stanza. Only one life which will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. And when I am dying, how happy I'll be. If the lamp of my life has burned out for thee. Mm. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. What a privilege it is to know you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The reward you have for those of us who are followers, we cannot even comprehend. For your word says, no ear has heard, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for the hope we have in heaven. Amen. God, if there's someone here today who hasn't settled their account, has not made that escape through the blood of Jesus from the land of bondage and the power of Satan, then God, today, may they make that choice. And Lord God, as we come to these three days next week, we set aside to pray and fast. We thank you, God, that we're praying to a God who is all-powerful. A God who is able to change the minds of the Persian people and set, them, set the people of God free. It caused the Persians to want to become Jews. Hallelujah for the power of prayer. Hallelujah for the power of God. So today, Lord, uh, so bring message perhaps, but yet so filled with hope. We pray that you will teach us to number our days, that we might be given and get and obtain a heart of wisdom. So bless us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Worship team is going to come. We're going to sing a song before we take communion together. I was reading something from Charles Stanley this week, I found online. It says there's a basic truth to shifting your life out of reverse into forward gear. It's this, no matter what your circumstances are, or what you have done in the past, God loves you with an everlasting love, and He will make your life count for something wonderful if you place your trust in Him. Don't be discouraged by this day's message, okay? This message is meant to encourage us. And remember that little poem that I quote once in a while here. Though you cannot go back and make a brand new start, my friend. Anybody can start from now and make a brand new end. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's make a brand new end. Let's do even better tomorrow. Realizing that these enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil, want to try to defeat us. 
that we've come none victorious, but we want to triumph in Christ, triumph through the blood and the power of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Why don't we stand together and just put our hearts into this next song with the worship team is coming as we prepare for communion.